Good afternoon. Good afternoon and welcome to the National Press Club. My name is Monroe Carmen. I'm president of the club and editor at large at Bloomberg Business News. I'd like to welcome club members and their guests in the audience as well as those of you watching on C-SPAN or listening to this program on National Public Radio or the Global Internet Computer Network. Before introducing our head table, I would like to remind you all of our upcoming speakers. On Thursday, March 23rd, U.S. Trade Representative Mickey Cantor will discuss U.S. trade beyond China. On Thursday, March 30th, May Rudolph Giuliani of New York City will address the club. On Friday, April 7th, we will have a breakfast event, a breakfast event with Representative Dick Armey, the majority leader from Texas, who will report on the GOP scorecard for the first 100 days. Also on Friday, just to have uh, an opportunity to give equal time, at lunch, House Minority Leader Richard Gephardt has been invited to give the Democratic view of the first 100 days. Uh, transcripts and audio and videotapes of Press Club luncheons are available by calling 1-800-500-9911. That's 1-800-500-9911. If you have any questions for our speaker, please write them on the cards at your table, pass them up, and I will ask as many as time permits. I'd like to now introduce our head table and ask them to stand briefly uh, when their names are mentioned from your right. Richard Burke of the New York Times, Beth Schwinn, Hearst Newspapers, Rick Dunham, Business Week, Michelle Kay, Austin American Statesman, Craig Hines, Washington Bureau Chief, Houston Chronicle, Carl Lubsdorf, Washington Bureau Chief, Dallas Morning News. Larry Neal, Press Secretary to Senator Graham. Skipping over our speaker for the moment, Mark Johnson, Media General Newspapers and Chairman of the National Press Club Speakers Committee. Dan Carney of the Houston Post and the member of the Speakers Committee who arranged today's luncheon. Ron Hutchison, Washington Bureau Chief, Fort Worth Star-Telegram. Sabrina Eaton of the Cleveland Plain Dealer, Dan Baltz of the Washington Post, Jim Barnes of the National Journal, and Lisa Richwine of State's News Service. <laughs> Our guest today is Senator Phil Graham of Texas. He describes himself as the only, quote, true conservative, unquote, in the race for the Republican nomination to run for the office of President of the United States next year. What is a true conservative? Well, we know something of how Senator Graham defines the term. He's against all this spending by the federal government, unless, of course, it benefits Texas. <laughs> He's against crime, unless, of course, that requires banning ownership of assault weapons. He's against health care reform that requires employers to cover their workers. He's against spending American dollars to rescue Mexico. He's against affirmative action programs that favor minorities and women. He's against a woman's right to, choo uh, to choose abortion. He's against Democrats in general and Bill Clinton in particular. <laughs> so what's Phil Graham for? He stands four square in favor of, quote, saving the American dream. That's the title of his address today. Hopefully, the senator will tell us how he plans to accomplish that should he become the nation's 43rd president. Right now, the polls show Senator Graham is an underdog in the Republican primaries, at least to one of his rivals. Yet it would be a mistake a serious mistake to underestimate the senator. He's accustomed to beating the odds. He was born to modest circumstances. His father, an army master sergeant, died when Graham was still a teenager. His mother worked for a time in a cotton mill. 
As a youngster, the senator's biggest problem was learning to read. And for all you youngsters watching on television or listening on radio, mind this, he failed the third grade, he failed the seventh grade, he failed the ninth grade. So those of you who are having trouble, there's hope. Here's a role model. When he finally did learn to read in high school, he rapidly made up for lost time. He earned a doctorate in economics at the University of Georgia and became a tenured professor at, uh, professor, excuse me, at Texas A&M by the time he was 30 years of age. Without connections and a novice, Graham entered Texas politics, winning election to the House of Representatives in 1978 as a Democrat. There he gained national recognition by organizing Democratic support for President Reagan's tax cuts and defense buildup. When resentful Democrats kicked him off the House Budget Committee, he switched to the Republican Party in 1983 and won the Senate seat he now holds. Senator Graham's political success can be attributed, at least in part, to his down-to-earth campaigning style. I told you I was going to get this in, right? Uh, Representative Sonny Bono of California credits his own election to the House to his observation of Senator Graham on the campaign trail. Bono tells how the senator roused an audience in small town Texas to a feverish pitch with the now classic political line, you can't eat corn if you ain't a pig. <laughs> Neither Bono nor I understands what that means, <laughs> nor I suspect does Senator Graham. But it worked. <laughs> Senator Graham also is an acute political observer. He was here at the press club last fall before the November election and in a debate with Senator Graham of uh, Florida. Senator Graham of Texas accurately predicted that the Republicans would take over both uh, houses of Congress he was right. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm proud to present the dreamer from Texas, Senator Phil Graham. Thank you, Doug. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, bud. And if you're listening on the radio and you hear a click and I go off, you know it was the loss of federal funding. <laughs> Not that I lost, that ran out of anything to say. I'm very happy to be here, but I want to thank you for inviting me. Over the weekend, some of my Republican colleagues on the Finance Committee, I read in the Washington Post today, spent the weekend with our Democratic colleagues and came back, back from that retreat thinking and sounding like Democrats. In fact, they're now saying that tax cuts are out of order in the Republican Senate. Well, let me assure you that tax cuts are in order in the Republican Senate. I am for them. They're part of our contract with America. And the United States Senate is not going to become a black hole for the contract for America. Now, today I'd like to talk about Deficit reduction, I'd like to talk about the Tenth Amendment and the passing of decision-making back to the states and to the people, and I'd like to talk about tax cuts. And I'd like to try to reconcile my thinking and I think the thinking of the Republican Party on these issues, and then I can't pass up the opportunity to say a little bit about running for president, trying to trade in the little shovel I had in the House uh, for the bigger shovel I had in the Senate, for the biggest shovel we have in a free society as president to do more of the work of the American people on exactly the kind of issues that I want to talk about today. First of all, I believe that the federal government is too big, too powerful, too expensive, too distant, and increasingly too hostile, and so do the American people. Bud noted the last time I was here, I predicted that Republicans would take over the Congress, and they did. 
and they took over the Congress because the American people said to their government, stop the taxing, stop the spending, and stop the regulating. Now, we are obviously in a debate, mostly in the Senate, about what to do about the role of government in a free society. We have some people who argue with some logic, though I think not correctly, that there is an inconsistency in the goal of balancing the federal budget and letting working people keep more of what they earn to spend themselves, to invest for themselves in their future and the future of America. I see no such inconsistency. First of all, let me try very briefly to break the budget into several parts. First of all, I believe that you have to look at the entire $1.6 trillion federal budget and apply what I call the Dickey Flat test to it. I pledge that by the end of the campaign that every person in America will know the Dickey Flat test, but knowing that this is a very enlightened group, I know you know the Dickey Flat test. And basically what we have to do to meet the Dickey Flat test in government spending is ask the question, do the benefits we derive by spending money on this program equal or exceed the cost we impose on hard-working men and women like Dickey Flat, who in the case of Dickey Flat, a printer from Mahaya, never quite gets that blue ink off the end of his fingers. Now, I have said now in Congress, both in the House and the Senate, that I believe that much of what the federal government does does not meet the Dickey Flat test. Since we round to the nearest $50 million in the budget, we tend to lose the cold reality that behind every dollar we spend is a hard-working American uh, man or woman who worked hard for that money and who probably would have spent it better if they got to keep it. I believe if we apply the Dickey Flat test to discretionary spending and to entitlements, that a substantial part of the federal government will not stand up to that test. And the way to balance the budget is by applying the working man and the working woman test to the federal budget. But there are programs that would meet the Dickey Flat test that still should not be undertaken by the federal government. And it's those programs that I want to talk about in terms of passing power and funding back to people and back to state and local government. I believe that expenditures on education meet the Dickey Flat test. Not every expenditure, not every program, but in general, my argument is not that America is spending too much on education. Now, I certainly would argue we are not spending the money we spend on education very wisely, but mostly because of who is doing the spending. Virtually every Republican candidate for president has come out for eliminating the Department of Education. Now, I'm not absolutely certain what they mean, but let me tell you what I mean. I'd like to take the $32 billion we spend on the Department of Education and terminate federal involvement in education and take half that money and give it to parents with a tax credit per child so that families can keep more of what they earn to invest in their own children, in the education of their children, in their own family, in their own future. And the reason I would like to do that is that I believe families are better decision-making units than the federal government in making decisions about the education of their children. Now, I don't diminish the fact that there are many federal bureaucrats in Washington who love our children. It's only I find when I visit with them personally, they never know our children's names. What I want to do is to pass power and decision-making back to families. And the first type of tax cut, as it's called, in the contract with America is not really a tax cut in the following sense. We're talking about cutting spending in areas where the federal government is spending the family's money on the family's behalf for the family's benefit. In 1950, the average American family with two children sent one out of every $50 it earned to Washington, D.C. 
Today, that family is sending one out of every four dollars it earns to Washington, D.C. So obviously, the federal government is doing more on behalf of American families, spending an ever-increasing share of their income. I want a tax credit for children so that working families can keep more of their own money to invest it in their own children, and I want to terminate or reduce federal expenditures such as in the Department of Education, not because I want to spend less on education, not because if we went into other areas I want to spend less on housing or less on nutrition. Bill Clinton and the Democrats to the contrary. The debate is not about how much money is going to be spent on education or housing and, or nutrition or all the other things that we're all for. The debate's not about how much we're going to spend on those things. The debate is about who's going to do the spending. Should the federal government be doing the spending or should the family be doing the spending? I know the federal government and I know the family and I know the difference. And since we're betting the future of America, I want to bet the future of America on families and not governments. So when, when some of my colleagues are saying that they are not for letting families spend more of their own money on their own needs and they want the government to keep providing for those needs for them, they do not speak for me and they do not speak for the party that I know and to the Republican uh, grassroots supporters that I'm meeting every weekend all over America. And I want to assure you I feel very strongly about this issue and we are going to vote on letting working families keep more of what they earn in the United States Senate. Now let me take the second part of this issue as it relates to business. We all understand that we're getting ready to reform welfare and we're going to ask millions of people that are riding in the wagon on welfare to get out of the wagon and help the rest of us pull. Those of us who are being honest have got to admit that in some cases that's going to be difficult. So we want the economy to be strong. We want to create more jobs, more growth, more opportunity for America. Now you can argue that the federal government is doing that. The federal government's got all kinds of programs in the Department of Commerce where we're subsidizing American business to do various things. We've got all kinds of programs in the Labor Department, in the Agriculture Department. We've got all kinds of programs at SBA where the government is deciding where investment should occur. The government is deciding what technology deserves public support. I think Secretary Reich called that corporate welfare. Uh, the day he came out and said that, I said I'd like to see that list that I thought I might want to co-sponsor that bill in Congress. He disappeared for about two weeks. I thought he might have been killed and his body hidden somewhere. But he wrote me a letter the other day so I know that he is still out there. And I want to renew my offer to work with the administration. But let me tell you what I want to do with the money. I believe instead of the federal government spending public funds to quote stimulate business and to encourage investment something that no reasonable rational person in 1995 could believe that government is capable of doing I want to go back and cut those programs and I want to use the savings to cut the capital gains tax rate so that rather than the government trying to decide where jobs are created, we can have the market system decide where jobs are created. So that people who have ideas, who have a vision for a new business or a new product, can benefit if they're willing to put their assets at risk or convince others to in making an investment. Now I know I want to give Bill Clinton equal time. If Bill Clinton were here, he'd jump up and down and say, if you cut the capital gains tax rate, do you realize that if rich people put their capital at risk and they create jobs, that they'll profit? Yeah, I realize it. The system is called free enterprise. 
Mr. President, this is America. And if America is going to be saved, it is going to be saved at a profit. I have had many jobs in my life. I've worked in a peanut processor. I've worked in a boat factory. I've worked in a cabinet shop. In addition to all the traditional grocery store jobs and newspaper jobs, but I have never been hired by a poor person. Now, I know that's kind of a startling statement, but if you'll think back on it, I think you will find that no poor person ever hired you. That for the great majority of us, we got jobs and got our foot on the bottom rung of the economic ladder because somebody else had gotten their foot on the bottom rung, climbed way up on that ladder, and then they accumulated capital, and they put it at risk, and it gave us a chance to get a job. I want to do that again in America. I don't want the government to do it. I don't want the government to decide where investment is going to occur. I want the private sector to make those decisions because I want real jobs with real opportunity and real growth. That's what the contract for America is about. It is not a question of cutting taxes on business. It is a question of taking money that we are now spending very inefficiently, almost always with political motivation, to try to, quote, help business, to try to create jobs. I want to cut those programs and terminate many of them and use those, that money to fund cutting the capital gains tax rate so that we can have the private sector create the jobs we need to induce people to take risk and to engage in enterprise. Now, when we're talking about reducing the deficit, I am not aware that there has been a single major proposal to eliminate the Department of Education as part of deficit reduction. And I am not making that proposal. I'm talking about letting parents and local school boards, I forgot the other half of the equation, give half the money to parents and let them invest it in their own children's education, give the other half of the money to the states and the local school boards, and let local parents, local teachers, and locally elected school board officials set education policy. If I become president, I am a teacher, but I don't want to be the education president. I want families to have education parents. I think we have proven beyond any doubt to any reasonable person that the federal government cannot run education in America. I long for the day when we're going to prove to people that government cannot create jobs, growth, and opportunity either. So to conclude this point, what we're talking about in what is being referred to here as tax cuts is simply the transfer of the ability to spend the money you earn back to you so you can invest it in your own children, in their own well-being, while we reduce spending on programs that we were spending on your behalf or on your children's behalf. And in terms of cutting the capital gains tax rate, we're not talking about giving business something. We're talking about taking away from business the special privilege that comes from corporate welfare and from subsidies that often make no sense, and then reducing tax rates on capital gains so that industry and agriculture have incentives to make investments. Finally, let me sum up by trying to say in two different ways, it's really two sides of the same coin, why I'm running for president. I'm running for president in part because as a young congressman, I was the author of the Reagan budget in the House. That budget cut spending, rebuilt defense, and mandated the 1981 tax cut, and therefore played a role in creating 20 million new jobs and winning the Cold War. I'm running for president because I want to finish the Reagan revolution. I'm also running for president because I believe if we don't change the policy of our government, if we don't change it soon, 
And if we don't change it dramatically, in 20 years we're not going to be living in the same country that we grew up in. I think whether you look at crime or illegitimacy or the deficit or the tax burden or the breakdown of the traditional values that made America great to begin with and have sustained it for over 200 years, you've got to reach the frightening conclusion that we're either going to change the way our government does our business or we're going to lose the American dream. That's the bad news. The good news is we're not asking government to do anything that is any harder than the decisions that are made every day in American business and in American households. We're not asking the government to do anything harder than literally hundreds of thousands of businesses in this country have had to do to restructure their businesses to stay in business in the last year. We're not asking the government to make any decisions that are tougher than decisions that are made by real parents in real households in America where you're saying no to people you love the most, your children. The difference is that families and businesses in America live in the real world where you have to make tough choices, where you have to say no. Our government has not lived in the real world in 40 years, and if I become president, that's going to change. Let me stop and throw it open. I'd be very happy to try to answer any questions. Thank you, sir. For openers, you claim to be the true conservative, the only true conservative in this race. That's compared to Senator Dole. Now that uh, Pat Buchanan has entered the race, does that render you the only true moderate? <laughs> well, listen, first of all, thank you for making the point about Senator Dole. <laughs> I don't, I, I never challenge anybody's statement. I thought I said that I was conservative before conservative was cool. And I thought I said that of all the people running for president, I was the most committed to fundamentally changing American government. In terms of Pat Buchanan, there are a lot of issues that I agree with Pat on. Uh, I do not agree with Pat that we can build a wall around America uh, and that we can uh, turn over leading the world to somebody else. And uh, I don't accept the idea that Americans can't compete. Uh, but what I'm going to try to do in this campaign is to define my vision, to talk about the problems that face America, and I'm going to try to to tell people the truth, which is sometimes unpleasant. I'm going to try to define a vision uh, of how we solve these problems in practical terms that people can understand and believe in and hopefully support. And I'm going to try to convince people that I'm tough enough to get the job done uh, and that I have a record to prove it. Finally, one of the things that ultimately happens in a campaign, and quite frankly, it ought to happen more often. I think Bill Clinton is going to mean it's going to happen more often than it used to, and that is every politician ought to be called on to square their rhetoric with their record. And I think when we get to the point in the campaign when people are looking at our records on everything from uh, taxes and spending to health care uh, and to quotas. I think when people look at my record and they listen to my rhetoric uh, that they're going to see that the two are the same and I think that's going to benefit me. Well, let's take a Pat Buchanan position first. Do you agree uh, with his idea to station the National Guard on the border to keep out illegal immigrants and do you favor a nationwide proposition 187, as they had in California. Bud, why you had, you got all those questions down there about that are, would help me, and you're asking me these tough questions. That's to get you softened up. Okay. First of all, had I been in California, I would have voted for Prop 187 because the people of California didn't have the ability to deal with a problem at its source. As president, and quite frankly, as a member of the Senate, I have the ability to deal with the underlying problem. 
That's why when I became chairman of Commerce State Justice, I came out and said that I will cut other programs to make it possible for me as chairman to double the size of the Border Patrol. And that is a down payment on my absolute commitment to gain control of our federal borders. Now, I think Anybody who is saying, let's put the National Guard on the borders, doesn't understand that when you put the National Guard on the borders, you have to pay them. And I think it makes more sense to recruit people into the Border Patrol and train them for that type work and to commit the resources to do it in that way. That's how I would do it. A question on the contract with America's tax cuts. You have been identified for a long time with deficit reduction. So the questioner asks, doesn't the $500 a child tax credit by adding $180 billion to the debt hurt future taxpayers who cannot vote today, as well as possibly encouraging people to have children, even those who cannot afford them? Well, first of all, the tax cut, as you're calling it, would go only to people who are working and paying taxes. Uh, and if they want to have more children, God bless them, because we need people to pull the wagon and we need people to steer it, and uh, we're looking for good leadership and good people and people who espouse the basic uh, values of working people in America. Uh, now in terms of this tax cut, the whole contract uh, which includes all the business tax cuts, repealing the Social Security tax increase, increase of the Clinton administration, eliminating the earnings test for Social Security, both of those provisions I strongly support. The whole contract is $187 billion. Remember, we're spending $1.6 trillion a year. But I go back to my point. Number one, I'm not proposing letting people keep one nickel that we don't stop spending. What I'm proposing is taking the very programs for the fam for business where we're spending people's money on their behalf when they could spend their own money better for themselves, stop the programs from spending money on their behalf and let them spend money for themselves. These are not programs in general that we're talking about cutting to balance the federal budget to reduce the deficit. So I see basically three changes needed in the budget. Number one, cut government spending, period. Number two, reduce programs where government is spending money on behalf of the family for legitimate purposes, but let the family spend their own money on their own behalf for those same legitimate purposes, and let businesses have the right to make their own investments and to benefit from those investments rather than getting government subsidies. And finally, we have another set of programs where the program could be conducted more efficiently by state or local government, so rather than the federal government doing it, pass the funding back to the level of government that can do it best and let them do it. Congress must pass it, a debt limit increase again later this summer. Do you plan to propose attaching some sort of budget reform legislation to that, a so-called Graham Rudman IV, if you will? I don't know. Rudman, uh, I don't know whether I'll include Rudman's name on it or not. <laughs> Depends on how nice he is to me in his new book. If you're listening, Warren, be warned. Um, Yes, I intend to uh, mend the debt ceiling. I mean, as I, when I first came to Congress, the first debate I was ever involved in, uh, and I was involved in it sort of inadvertently, I got up to speak before I thought about the consequences of it. Uh, we were debating the debt ceiling, and uh, then Majority Leader Jim Wright got up and said, in terms nobody would use today, uh, that if your spouse went out and spent a lot of money, that any gentleman would pay the bills. Well, I thought there was an obvious response to that. And so I got up and said, well, you know, people would pay their bills, 
But there's one other thing they would do that we never do, and that is they'd sit down around the kitchen table, they'd get out the credit cards, they'd get out the butcher knife, they'd cut up the credit cards, they'd write a budget, and they would make sure that the same thing didn't happen to them next month. And every time we pass one of these debt ceilings, we give the same lecture about you got to pay your bills, but we don't ever chop up the credit cards, we don't ever write a budget, and so I got up and opposed the debt ceiling, and sure enough, we defeated it. And I never got out of the doghouse with the Democratic leadership until I became a Republican, uh, years later and many confrontations after that. So what better time to get out the butcher knife and go after the credit cards than when the bill collector is at the door? It is the logical time to try to do these things, and I can pledge to you this debt ceiling will not pass without us going back and either adopting a balanced budget amendment to the Constitution or beginning to limit the growth in the public debt. Shifting to welfare, where do you stand on welfare payments for children of unmarried mothers under the age of 18? I think illegitimacy is one of the great problems that we face. I think the explosion uh, of illegitimacy in our big cities, over half of all the children born in our big cities are born out of wedlock uh, today. If the current trend continues in 20 years, illegitimacy will be the norm and not the exception in America. And I think it's something we've got to deal with. I'm very concerned about a welfare system that rewards people for having more children. I believe we have an obligation uh, to try to take care of, help, nurture, and find a place pulling the wagon for people who, uh, for children who are already born. I think, however, if we want to love our country 20 years from now, we are going to have to change this system so that we do not give uh, women who conceive additional children more money for doing it. We help the child, but we don't help the people who made that decision. And I know that's hard. And I know that there are a thousand and one horror stories that you can write about, that you can find that are real. You don't have to make them up. But the point is, can anybody say the current system is working? Can anybody say the current system is more compassionate? Can anybody say that the current system really is a stepping stone to real equality and opportunity in America? I think the answer to that is no. So it's not that this transition is going to be easy. It's not that any new program is going to be perfect. But it's that we are seeing the systematic destruction of our country by the current system, and it has got to be changed. Do you see any middle ground between advocates and opponents of affirmative action? Are there any circumstances, in your view, under which affirmative action requirements should be retained? Let me first say, Bud, that I never use the term affirmative action. And I never use it because I don't know what it means. If by affirmative, and I think that when Lyndon Johnson put it in his first executive order, he used it because nobody knew what it meant. If by affirmative action you meant working to see that everybody gets a chance to get on the playing field of life and get, use their God-given talents, I'm for it. If you mean outreach to see that people get a chance to compete, I'm for it. Uh, certainly, I am absolutely committed to knocking down every barrier to free and fair competition in America. And if I become president, there will never have been a president who is more committed to strict enforcement of the civil rights laws than I will be. But I am opposed to quotas, and I am opposed to set-asides, and so help me God, if I become president, they're going to end in America. And they're going to end in America because they are fundamentally wrong. There is only one fair way to decide who wins, and that's merit. There's only one way in America 
to decide who gets the promotion, who gets on the editorial board, who gets to go to work for the Fort Worth Star-Telegram. And the way to do that is to do it on merit. And it is more important in America than in any other country in the world because it's not our skin or our blood, it's our hearts that make us Americans. And we cannot let people be judged based on the group they're in. That's unfair. Uh, they have to be judged as individuals based on their merit. And this is a fundamental principle to me. And I don't see a middle ground on this principle. Middle ground is unfairness. Uh, it is divisive to say to one person that you're either going to be advantaged or disadvantaged based on who your daddy was or where you came from. Uh, that's just not the American way. Uh, our parents and grandparents uh, and great and great grandparents came to this country from all over the world to be Americans, to get an opportunity to compete and succeed or fail on their own individual merits. And there can't ever be another way that's the American way on this issue. Will you try to repeal the ban on assault weapons? And do you own one? <laughs> well, first of all, I think Bob Dole's beaten me to the punch on this. Um, I do not support gun control. I believe gun control does not work. And I submit to an impartial world uh, uh, the experience of the District of Columbia, where I'm standing. If gun control worked, this would be the safest spot on the planet. It is the murder capital of the world. Why? Because I'm without punishment in the District of Columbia. If you murder somebody in the District of Columbia, and you're one of the few who is apprehended and convicted, you're going to serve on average five years and six months in prison. No wonder there's so many murders in the District of Columbia. You give me 10 years in prison without parole for toting a pistol when you're committing a violent crime or a drug felony, 20 years for discharging it, and the death penalty for killing somebody, and I'll stop this violent crime wave. But taking away people's right to own guns violates the Second Amendment of the Constitution. Depends on how you uh, define assault weapons as to whether I own one. I own lots of shotguns. I own rifles. I'm a hunter, sportsman, and I want everybody in America to be if they want to be. If they don't want to be, if they want to lose an important part of their life, that's okay. How has the Mexican financial crisis affected your view of free trade agreements with the rest of Latin America, especially now that Chile has been invited to become a part of NAFTA? First of all, it's in no way affected my view. Uh, the problem in Mexico has to do with the fact that they don't have an independent monetary authority, that in the build-up to their election they started printing a lot of money. They had an explosion in prices, and the value of the peso went down, as any freshman student in economics anywhere in America would have predicted. Uh, so NAFTA had nothing to do with irresponsible government in Mexico. The lesson is, even with an enlightened trade policy, you still need a good government. Uh, I am for Chile coming into NAFTA, and let me, in an era when others are repeating, ma retreating, make it very clear. I want a free trade agreement that goes from the Arctic to the Antarctic. I want every person uh, living in any, in any hut, in any village in the Americas to have the freedom uh, to go to work and produce something and sell it anywhere else in the Americas without government interference as long as it is a legal commodity. member of the audience says, in a fundraising letter that I received from Senator Specter, who is also trying to win the Republican presidential nomination, he claims that the Republican Party is targeted to be taken over by the extreme right-wing groups called the religious right. Do you think that is a serious possibility? Well, I hope whoever got this letter got a letter from me and they threw Arlen's away and they sent me a check. <laughs> if you didn't, give me your name and address after the meeting and I'll send you one of my own letters. 
What is happening all over America is that people who hold to the traditional values of faith and family are discovering that the Democratic Party of today has turned its back on them. And as a result, they are turning their backs on the Democrats. Now, the Democrats can't very well say, well, look, we've lost the confidence of the American people because they've discovered that we're taking their money to buy votes for ourselves through government. I mean, they can't very well do that, and I don't blame them. Uh, that kind of honesty would be out of character, uh, and it would be very harmful to them. So I understand why they're not saying it, but they got to have an excuse. And the excuse is, well, something must be wrong with the Republican Party if people who hold to the traditional values of family and faith are becoming Republicans and rejecting Democrats. Nice try. And maybe they've convinced Arlen, but they hadn't convinced anybody else. Uh, quite frankly, uh, the people who are being called uh, extremists in many cases are simply talking today the way my mother talked when I was growing up. Uh, and as I look back on my life, the failings I've had have not come from listening to my mother's advice. They have come from not listening. Normally, after I uh, got hit upside the head by a two-by-four, not by my mother, but by hard experience, I started listening. But traditional values are important for America. Now, I don't want Bill Clinton imposing his values on you. I don't want to impose my values on you. But I don't want the government trying to change your values through welfare and through tax policy. As I said, you uh, have a reputation for being an astute uh, political observer. Here's a question. Please give us your analysis of California Governor Pete Wilson's expected entry into the race. And do you think a pro-choice candidate can win the GOP nomination? Well, first of all, I'm sure that the entry of any candidate affects every other candidate. I personally do not see Pete Wilson's entry into the campaign having much effect on me. I think there are a lot of issues that will determine the outcome of the uh, primaries and the caucuses uh, that will ultimately decide a Republican winner. Uh, I hope and believe that I'm going to win, and therefore, by definition, I have concluded that Pete Wilson probably is not going to win. I was very encouraged at the Republican State Convention uh, in California that when delegates expressed their preferences in a poll that 56 percent of them were for me and 14 percent of them were for Pete and 12 percent of them were for Bob Dole. Now, obviously, I still have some work to do in California uh, to get that 14 percent and that 12, but I think we're making progress. Several questioners, now that we're into politics, uh, uh, request that uh, you discuss the issue of the vice presidency. Will you make a Sherman-esque statement about your willingness to be a vice presidential candidate in 1996? Well, I thought you were going to ask me who I was going to pick. Uh, the other day, I was in one of our larger states, and someone with the local press corps said, well, now, when Bob Dole was here, he said he would consider our governor. His go our governor was on his short list. Is he on your short list? And I thought for a minute, I said, if Bob Dole had as many delegates as he has people on his short list to be vice president, he'd already be the nominee. I don't ha even have a single delegate. And so I think it'd be pretty presumptuous about me uh, talking about who I would pick as my running mate. And as a result, I just hadn't felt comfortable in doing that. If I win the nomination, I'm going to sit down and uh, try to figure out who the best person uh, to make the offer to and, and hope that they would uh, join my effort. In terms of me, uh, I'm running for president. That's the job I would like to have, uh, and that's the one I'm going to seek. All right, well, take a look at the other party. Do you expect that uh, President Clinton will face a primary challenge? And if so, from whom? 
Well, I don't. I never. I didn't consider myself an expert on the Democratic Party when I was a Democrat. Uh, they never listened to me on anything. Um, I I believe that Bill Clinton will be the nominee. I think the process with the front-loaded primaries is very much help an incumbent. I don't think Bill Clinton is a good president, but I think Bill Clinton is a great politician. And when he tells people that he feels their pain, they forget that he caused it. <laughs> and uh, I think, quite frankly, that if, if our party, and knowing that y'all are working people, I just assume you're Republicans, uh, I believe we would be very, very foolish to assume that Bill Clinton is just going to gently fade away and show back up Mark and so. I mean, there are some things about our president that I admire. He's tough. Uh, he didn't get here by being a pansy. Uh, and uh, uh, his views may be totally at variant with the thinking of Americans. Uh, they may be outmoded. They may have been rejected. Uh, but he hadn't gotten a message yet. And uh, I think if we're going to beat him, we better have a vigorous candidate uh, who can get out and ride on the bus, who uh, can and will kiss lots of babies, and who is willing to get out and, uh, and uh, take on Bill Clinton, uh, because I think we're going to have a tough campaign. Uh, I hope I'm the nominee, because I believe I can beat Bill Clinton. Uh, I think Bill Clinton is going to try to run a class warfare campaign. I think he's going to try to pit people against each other uh, based on their income. I think he's going to try to divide the country. And I think I'm the one Republican candidate uh, that uh, can chew him up and spit him out on that strategy. Uh, nobody is ever going to say that I am a country club Republican. Uh, and nobody is ever going to be able to say, I can't relate to real people and to working people. So that's a campaign. I look forward to the general election. Uh, there are a lot of people that are uh, running in the primary that I'm close to, that are my friends, that I admire. And that makes campaigns hard. Uh, and uh, I especially admire Bob Dole. I know everybody wants to write these stories that Bob Dole and I hate each other and that there's this bitter conflict. The plain truth is it's not so. And it's going to be a hard primary as a result. Uh, but I want to tell you, in the general election, if I'm the nominee, there's going to be a great joy in running against Bill Clinton. In fact, uh, uh, his former press secretary said it best when he said it would be a good campaign for America. It would give people a clear choice. I think America is ready to make that choice. I'm ready to give it to them. In that context, why do you think you have a reputation for being a mean pit bull? Actually, I don't see how anybody could look at my face and think that there is a mean bone in my body. The only mean in me is that I mean it. And you know, it is interesting, and I do admit that from time to time my mother reads articles who say that and, uh, that say that, and she's greatly distressed at how y'all are confused. <laughs> um, but let me say this, it is a strange phenomenon that in our real lives, which for many of us, the most important part of our real life is being a parent, in our real lives, we say no most to people we love most, our children. And it's part of doing the things that you know you have to do because you do love your children. And it's an interesting phenomenon that while that is a characteristic that is important and is a critical part of the most important undertaking in the country, parroting, that somehow if you say no in your public life, that you're mean. When Bill Clinton wanted to tear down the greatest health care system the world had ever known, I had a lot of colleagues in the Senate who thought, boy, we ought to cut a deal with Bill Clinton, because this thing's popular, it's going to pass, uh, and if they're dead bodies, they could be ours. 
Uh, I stood up and said no on health care. It wasn't popular. There were some people, I'm sure, even in the Senate, Republicans, who thought it was mean. Uh, but I thought it was the right thing to do, and by the time the debate was over, so did the American people. Before we get to the final question, I have a couple of gifts for you. First, a certificate of appreciation for being with us today. We thank, thank you, you very, very thank much. You. Secondly, a National Press Club coffee mug to keep you, you awake Great. and also to collect funds if you need it <laughs> you. for your campaign. Uh, and finally, the last question. Do you agree with Newt Gingrich that most editorial writers are unreconstructed socialists? <laughs> I always like to read their editorials and see what they say about me first before I make those decisions. Now, I think, let, let me put it this way. I, I think everybody in public life has to sort of come in their own mind to some reconciliation with the media. My own view of the media has always been that it's the battlefield on which the war of ideas is fought. When I was coaching little boy football, I, we often had bad officiating, not because people wanted to be bad, but because all the good officials were in the NFL or uh, in the Southwest Conference. And I found my first year coaching that I complained about the officiating, and what I did is I ended up demoralizing myself and the team. And so second year, I was a little wiser. And so I tried to figure out the officiating, if there was any pattern to it, and then adjust the game plan to it. Uh, I do believe that there is a higher standard of credibility in the American media today for a conservative than there is for a Democrat, I mean, than there is for a liberal Democrat, same thing. Um, and. I, I see it simply as a result of the fact that if somebody agrees with me, I find them more credible easier. And clearly, there are many people who go into journalism and historically have gone into journalism as crusaders, and crusading has meant more government. The interesting phenomenon is, is that 20 years from now, uh, when uh, some other poor devil is here uh, giving this speech, that probably the people who have gone into journalism will be people who think like I do, who wanted to crusade for freedom, and they're going to be saying, I have these great ideas about how government could make better decisions than you could make, but these guys in the media are all biased, and they won't give me a fair shake. Uh, let me make a final point. Uh, I never ask for fairness from the media, only mercy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Graham, for being with us. Thank you all for being with us, and good afternoon. Larry, if you'll tote my stuff.